So backing up a little, my name is Jamie Schulte. I'm a supervisor in our children and families practice group. And my colleague, Hannah Berkowitz, who is our staff attorney on our Disrupting the School to Prison Pipeline project, is going to be presenting for us today about the school to prison pipeline and specifically about implicit bias. Um, if I'm going to be monitoring the Q&A that's down here at the bottom. So if you have questions during the presentation, you're more than welcome to throw them into the Q&A. If it fits within what Hannah is currently presenting on, we'll try to answer those as we go, but we'll also save some time at the end for folks to ask questions. Um, Hannah, is there anything else? Or are you ready to jump in? Nope, I'm ready to go. All right, great. Thanks, Hannah. Okay. All right. So as Jamie said, uh, I'm Hannah Berkowitz, and I'm the staff attorney on the Ed Law team at Legal Aid Chicago. And along with Madeline Cargill, who's also here today, um, our project paralegal, uh, we run the Disrupting the School to Prison Pipeline project. Um, and this project is really intended to engage volunteers to represent youth in school discipline cases and juvenile records expungement which are the two strategies that we've identified as ways that we can disrupt the school to prison pipeline. But in order to do that, we need to first understand why the pipeline exists, the impact on students and our role in disrupting it. And so for this presentation, I'm going to be focusing on implicit bias and racial disproportionality in education and how it connects to the school to prison pipeline. And so we're going to start with implicit bias. And we're actually going to start with just a brief video um, into the understanding the unconscious mind. Oh, actually, hold on. I need to change my audio settings. Um, share sound. Oh, shoot. Man, we are having some tech issues today. <laughs> All right, third time's the charm. The unconscious mind is amazing. It can process vastly more information than our conscious mind by using shortcuts. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> All right, one more time. <laughs> the unconscious mind is amazing. It can process vastly more information than our conscious mind by using shortcuts based on our background, cultural environment, and personal experiences to make almost instantaneous decisions about everything around us. The snag is, it's wrong quite a lot of the time especially on matters that need rational thinking. Here's a classic example. A bat and a ball cost one pound 10 pence. If the bat costs one pound more than the ball, how much does the ball cost? Most people, including over 50% of students at some of the world's leading universities, get the answer wrong and say 10 pence. The answer is actually five pence. Many of us choose 10 pence without thinking. This is because our unconscious mind uses instinct, not analysis. So our unconscious is fallible. It's also biased. It makes snap judgments of people we meet, categorizing them according to gender, social and other characteristics. In milliseconds, we judge whether somebody is like us and belongs to our in-group. These are the people we favor. So men might favor men, while women might favor women. However, we can belong to different in-groups, and we like to be part of an in-group that's powerful, which could mean a woman favoring a man over a woman. That's unconscious bias. All of us have it, and it colors our decision without our realizing. Okay. So uh, before we get into the topic of bias, we're now going to do just a couple of activities to help demonstrate the dynamics of our automatic processing, which we just heard about in that video. Uh, so we're going to start with an activity called the Stroop Test. And this is done in two parts. So in the first part, you're going to look at a list of words 
and say the color of each word out loud. And it's a timed activity. So when I start the timer at the top of the screen, say each color, um, say the color of each word as quickly as you can. And when you're finished, check the timer and make a note of how long it took you. So now we're going to do part two of the test. I'm gonna ask you to do the exact same thing that you just did. Look at the list of words and say the color of each word. But this time the colors are not going to match the words. So remember you're saying the color of the word and not the word itself. And same as before, make sure that you check the timer when you're finished and note how long it took you. So you'll probably notice uh, that it took you a few more seconds to complete part two of the test. And that's because for our brains, part one is simple. The colors and the words match. So your implicit inclination to read the words that you saw in front of you aligned with the directive you were given, which was to say the color. Then in the second part, that automatic inclination to read the word diverged from the directive you were given, which was to say the color. And so because the word was not the same as the color, that automatic inclination to read the word the second time led you to take longer to complete that task because it interrupted that automatic processing in your brain. And so we're gonna do, look at one more activity. Uh, this is a variation on the Stroop test. Um, for the sake of time, we're not actually going to do this one, but the point is really to illustrate how we process and react to information. So in this task, you would have to classify the words that you see on the screen as either good or bad. In the first round, similar to the Stroop color test, you read each word aloud and you make the common association uh, saying whether the word is good or bad. So for example, in the first round, you would say flower good, poison bad. Then in the second round, you're asked to associate words that are typically considered good with the word bad and vice versa. So in this round, you would say flower is bad, poison is good. Like in part two of the Stroop test, it is, it's harder and it takes us more conscious effort to choose the right category when we're associating pleasant things with the word bad and unpleasant things with the word good. And that's because we all have implicit assumptions about what is good and bad. We all hold these unconscious associations and we make these evaluations about people, places, things or ideas. And we form these associations automatically and without actually intending to do so. The problem is that when we're making these snap judgments and we're acting quickly, it's easier and it takes less effort to rely on the implicit assumptions. It's harder for us to act in a way that consciously disrupts these assumptions that we've already made, but our brains actually are malleable and just like we can learn biases and create these automatic associations over time, we can also unlearn them and change them with motivation and intention. And so now I wanna take a minute just to just define this term that we're gonna be talking a lot about, implicit bias. So implicit bias refers to the attitudes, associations, and stereotypes that affect our understanding, decisions, and actions in an unconscious manner or without our conscious knowledge. But I wanna break that down a little bit more. So first we take the word bias. And bias is often used in a negative context but the word itself really just means an evaluation, an inclination, or a belief. So while you can have a bias that is either positive or negative, the word itself is actually a neutral term. And then next is implicit. So when we refer to implicit or unconscious processes, we're just referring to something that's happening outside of our conscious awareness. 
And like bias, the word implicit itself is not inherently good or bad. And as we saw over the last few slides, we do actually rely on our implicit processes to help us move efficiently in our day-to-day -day lives. But as we also saw in that video, we know it's possible for us to form implicit associations and make implicit evaluations based on inaccurate information. And because our implicit biases can impact our decisions and our behaviors, these unconscious associations and evaluations that we end up relying on can make it difficult for us to live up to those explicitly held values and beliefs. So to sum up, implicit bias refers to our evaluations or beliefs, whether they are positive or negative, that exist without us realizing it. But that still leaves us with the question of what our implicit biases are, because if they're unconscious, how do we know how, that we have them? So one way that we can identify our own biases is through taking these implicit association tests or IATs. So these come from Harvard's Project Implicit and these tests help, uh, help us identify biases that may affect our unconscious behavior. And they do so by measuring the strength of associations between concepts and evaluations. So since we can't all stop and take an IET right now, we're just gonna talk through the steps to understand how the test works. And we're gonna use the concept of age as an example. So in part one of the test, you're asked to sort words or images relating to concepts into categories. So in our example, our concept is age. So our categories would be young and old. So if the category of old is on the left side of the computer and a picture of an elderly person would appear on your screen, you would press the key to sort that picture to the left. Then in part two, you're asked to sort words or images relating to evaluations into categories. So similar to the Stroop test, uh, your evaluation or that variation on the Stroop test, those evaluations would be good and bad. So if the category good is on the left side of your computer screen and a pleasant word like happy appeared, you would press the computer key to sort that word to the left. Then in parts three, four, and five, this is where the actual implicit associations come in. Uh, so in three and four, you're asked to sort both concept and evaluation words. And when you take the test, the association between the concept and the evaluation is randomized across participants. But whichever association you're given in part three, you're going to make the opposite association in part five. So with our old young example, uh, in the third round, you might have old and bad on the left side and young and good on the right. So the key you would press to sort words relating to the concept of old is the same as what you would press to sort words relating to the evaluation bad. The only difference between parts three and four are just the location of the categories. So if in part three, old and bad is on the left, in part four, those categories will be on the right. And then finally, in part five, the associations you're making are going to be swapped. So if in the last two parts, you were doing old, bad, and young, good, in part five, your categories would be old and good on one side and young and bad on the other. And the IAT score is then based on how long it takes you on average to sort words in part three as opposed to in part five. And the idea behind that is that making a response is easier when closely related items share the same response key. So similar to that variation on the Stroop test, when you had words that are commonly associated, that are uh, commonly thought of as being good or positive, you are quicker to make that association than when it's the reversed. And so when your test results would indicate an implicit preference for young people relative to old people, if you're faster to categorize words when young and good share a response key, and old and bad share response key relative to the reverse. So at the end of this presentation, we are going to come back to implicit bias and we're gonna talk about strategies for interrupting our own biases. Um, but as I said, the first step is identifying biases you may have. And so I really encourage you all um, to visit the Project Implicit site after this presentation, take a few IATs on your own and start exploring um, any potential biases you may have. Okay, so now that we know what implicit biases are, we're gonna talk about how they impact education and specifically school discipline. So research has shown us that discipline guidelines are not applied evenly across schools or even among a single student body. And differences in discipline 
actually show up really strongly with regards to race and gender because our unconscious associations can affect how student behavior is perceived. So before we get into the examples, I do want to remind everybody and make sure everybody's keeping in mind that while both implicit and, or sorry, that both implicit and explicit biases do serve as kind of the foundation for upholding the systemic racism that we're going to talk about later. And it's especially prevalent in the school discipline context. Um, but while explicit bias is conscious and intentional, and unfortunately some ed educators can and do knowingly act on their biases, implicit bias is unconscious and automatic and logic is irrelevant to its occurrence. And so because of that, in the same way that we might not be aware of our own implicit biases, school staff may not realize that they're acting on their biases when making disciplinary decisions. So the point of this all is not to say schools and teachers and all these people are bad. Uh, we are just looking at what these biases are, how they come out and how they come into play and how they impact school discipline. So with that said, we'll get into some examples. Um, first is subjective infractions. So students are often disciplined for things like disruptive behavior, excessive noise, disrespect or insubordination. But these things all really depend on the context of the incident and they're highly subjective because what's too loud to you might not be too loud to me, or we might have differing definitions of what is disrespectful, disruptive, or what we perceive to be threatening. And so these questions are really up to the individual to answer and to then decide which disciplinary response is appropriate. And the ambiguity and that contextualized nature of these situations means that implicit bias can and does come out during the decision-making process. So for example, one study found that students of color are more likely to face discipline for subjective infractions. So those things like disruptive behavior, disrespect, excessive noise, while white students are actually more likely to face discipline for specific events like smoking or vandalism. Uh, next is disciplinary decisions. So implicit bias can and often does show up in, in decisions about the severity of discipline or in decisions about what may be an appropriate or feasible intervention to address behavior. And in one study, K through 12 teachers were given the discipline records of a fictional middle school student who had two disciplinary infractions, both of which were minor and unrelated. And that study found that teachers were more likely to escalate the disciplinary response following the second incident and to view the two infractions as being connected when the student had a stereotypically black name as opposed to a stereotypically white name. So essentially, when the student was identified as being black, teachers were more likely to view the two infractions as constituting a pattern of behavior and then decide that more severe disciplinary action was necessary to address that second infraction. And then lastly is confirmation bias. Um, I think this, People are probably familiar with this one. I think we hear about it a lot, um, especially in diversity trainings and things like that. Um, but this refers to the tendency for us to process information by looking for or interpreting information in a way that's with, consistent with or that confirms our own existing beliefs. And so to illustrate this, uh, one study found that when presented with a fictitious legal memo, evaluators found more errors and rated the memo as being lower quality when the author was listed as being black compared to when the author was listed as being white. And while that study focused on the evaluation of a legal memo, we can easily see this happening in a school setting, playing out in disparities when grading student essays or other work that relies on some subjective assessment. Uh, and then in the discipline context, we might see, um, say, a confrontation or a fight in a hallway, and we may see a teacher assume a particular student initiated that conflict because that teacher may have some implicit bias or stereotype against that student and draw conclusions that would confirm that bias or stereotype. So essentially we see more problems like disruptive behavior where we expect to see more problems. So now we're gonna take a look at some of the numbers. Um, all of the examples we talked about serve as possible explanations for this data, which confirms that the race at which students face discipline in school does vary depending on race. So on this slide, I have um, the national data from the 2015-16 school year, which showed the loss of instructional days due to out-of-school suspensions. 
And the data is broken down to show the impact on students based on race, as well as based on disability. And we are going to talk about disability a little bit later in the context of intersecting identities. So I did want to include that in this graphic. Um, but what's important here is that the numbers confirm what we already know, that Black students experience disproportionately high rates of expulsion, suspension, and other forms of exclusionary discipline at school. And other students of color, especially Indigenous and Hispanic or Latinx students, as well as students with disabilities, also face disproportionate rates of school discipline on certain measures like suspension rates. Meanwhile, white students across the board are less likely to experience expulsion, suspension, or other forms of exclusionary discipline. And in fact, in the 2015-16 school year, for every 100 students enrolled, Black students lost 103 days of instruction due to suspension, compared to only 21 days lost by their white peers. And actually, um, nationally, even though uh, Black students make up only about 15% of the national student enrollment, they consistently face higher suspension and expulsion rates um, than their white peers, but even than, other, um, than their other peers uh, in different uh, racial or ethnic groups like Hispanic, white, and Asian, Hispanic and Asian, um, as we saw on the last slide, the Native American groups too. Um, and so on this slide, I have data from a study from the U.S. Department of Ed um, of students who started school in 2009, uh, and it looked at the percentage by race of students who were suspended or expelled by 2012. Uh, and to show the biggest disparities, they pulled out Black, Hispanic, white, and Asian students. And you can see that nationally, 36% uh, of Black students had been either suspended or expelled in that time, compared to only 14% of white students. And further research has shown that compared to their white peers, Black students are actually three times more likely to be expelled and four times more likely to face one or more out-of-school suspension. And that disproportionate rate of discipline affects all Black students, regardless of their age. Because while Black K-12 students are 3.8 times more likely than white K-12 students to get one or more out-of-school suspension, Black preschool age children are also 3.6 times more likely to get one or more out of school suspension than their white peers. And it's also important to point out that this is not just happening nationally. Discipline data in Illinois uh, similarly shows that Black students are facing disproportionate rates of discipline compared to their white peers. And so, for example, in 2019, um, black students made up only about 17% of enrollment in Illinois, but they accounted for nearly 50% of out-of-school suspensions. Meanwhile, white students made up nearly 50% of enrollment, but accounted for only about 25% of out-of-school suspensions. And even in schools where there's a higher enrollment of black students, these disparities still persist. Uh, in Chicago public schools, um, data from the 2013-14 school year shows that while Black students made up about 40% of the student population, they accounted for nearly 75% of all out-of-school suspensions in CPS and almost 80% of all expulsions. And so what is causing this disproportionality? Well, research has shown us that these racial disparities in discipline are not actually explained by more frequent or more serious misbehavior by students of color. As we've seen that implicit bias as well as policies and practices that disproportionately harm students of color plays a major role in explaining the racial disparities that we see in school discipline. And so now we're going to move on to systemic racism and the school to prison pipeline. So, as I said, racial disproportionality is not solely attributed to implicit and explicit bias. Uh, systemic policies and practices also play a major role in creating these disparities. And so Race Forward um, published a report in 2014 called Moving the Race Conversation Forward. And in that report, they looked at more than a thousand articles and news stories from throughout the country to identify the most common mistakes that we make when we talk about race. And one of the biggest issues that they identified was this tendency to focus too much on individuals instead of systems. But it's really important to remember that there are actually different levels to racism. And so we'll start with the individual level because this is really the simplest to focus on and the easiest one to recognize in our everyday lives. 
And when we talk about interrupting our own biases, these are the levels of racism that we're trying to address. So first is internalized racism. This is all of the prejudice, bias, and blind spots that you might have within yourself as an individual. So these are those implicit and explicit biases that we were talking about. Next is interpersonal racism. And this is what happens when we act out that internalized racism on each other. And it's what we most commonly identify as racism. It's things like microaggressions, discrimination, and hate speech. And so while we're all really fam pretty familiar with that individual level, there is another level to that, and it's systemic racism. And at the systemic level, we have both institutional and structural racism. So institutional racism, these are the racist policies, discriminatory practices in schools, workplaces, government agencies, basically within institutions that routinely produce unjust outcomes for people of color. And then finally, we have structural racism. So this refers to the unjust racist patterns and practices that play out across the institutions that make up our society. And so in this section, we're gonna take a look at how um, systemic racism through policy choices uh, and um, in both institutional and structural racism leads us to these racial inequities that we see in school discipline and the juvenile justice system. And the reason why I wanted to talk about these different levels to racism uh, and why I brought up that race forward um, that race forward study is because these different levels are often glossed over. And race forward actually found that two thirds of race focused news coverage actually fails to consider how systemic racism factors in. But it's a really critical piece to actually understanding racism and especially in understanding our role in the school to prison pipeline. Because when we focus just on the individual level, it distorts our understanding of how racism actually works. And it encourages us to see racism only as the product of these overt intentional racist acts, that interpersonal racism that we can easily identify, that can be fixed by correcting individual defects. But it also encourages us to see individual stories of people, groups, communities transcending racism as proof that there is no more racism. But we know that systemic racism is deeply embedded in our society, and the school to prison pipeline is a really stark example of that. And so it's essential that we understand what's actually caused inequities in order to identify ways that we can help to disrupt the pipeline. So before we get into systemic racism, I do want to go back to the school to prison pipeline and really define that term and give you um, an illustration to show how it really works. And so the school to prison pipeline is the term that we use to refer to the policies and practices that serve to push students out of schools and classrooms and into the juvenile and criminal justice systems. So what happens, um, you know, when students are suspended or expelled, they lose out on instru instruction time. And the logical consequence then is that by missing out on class, their learning is going to suffer. But the effects of exclusionary discipline go way beyond the harm of just missing a class because research has shown us that when a student is suspended, that student is more likely to be held back a grade and not be promoted. They're less likely to graduate on time. They're more likely to be referred to law enforcement and they're more likely to enter into the juvenile justice or criminal justice system. And so when we look at the impact on a whole, we can see that this loss of classroom time has really this ripple effect impacting not only a student's current and future education, but also their likelihood of being involved in the legal system. And then once involved in the legal system, it can have even more serious consequences like impacting their employment options, their education options, and their ability to access resources like public benefits and housing. And it all starts with students being pushed out of school and into the pipeline by exclusionary discipline. So in this section, we're gonna take a look at systemic racism in education and in the discipline context as well as in the juvenile justice system, so we can better understand how the systems work to actually create the pipeline. And again, understand what we as lawyers can do to disrupt that and to mitigate the effects for those who have already been justice involved. So systemic racism impacts a lot of different areas of education, and there are specific racialized impacts that come from our policy choices. 
And these choices then perpetuate racial and economic segregation and inequity. So one specific example in the education context, we see these structural racial inequities play out in funding and resource distribution, which then gets reflected in these disciplinary disparities. So for example, in Illinois, school funding has long been pretty regressive. On average, lower income schools in Illinois receive about $10,000 per student compared to the $13,000 per student that higher income schools receive. And districts with high percentages of black and brown students face the largest funding gaps. And what happens is these underfunded schools often make the choice to invest in police officers and security personnel rather than social workers and counselors. So in 2016, the 74, a nonprofit, nonpartisan news site looking at education in America, did an investigation into school staffing in the country's 10 largest school districts. And they found that nationally, of the 21 suburban school districts, which are generally whiter and higher income, surrounding our country's largest urban districts, all but one suburban district employed more counselors and social workers than security. Meanwhile, Chicago Public Schools employs fewer counselors and social workers than security personnel um, at about 1,100 to 1,400. Uh, and so the chart on this slide is from the 74's follow-up investigation, which expanded on their initial report and took a deep dive into um, our largest school districts and the surrounding areas. And they found that of the Illinois district survey, CPS was the only district where security staff outnumbered school counselors and social workers. And really interestingly, the only survey district in the area that had fewer counselors and social workers per student than Chicago Public Schools was uh, District U46 in Elgin, which serves largely students of color from low-income households. And so you can compare that to um, the numbers seen at Glenbrook and New Trier, commonly more white middle to upper middle class uh, districts. Um, and we can really see uh, these differences um, and the funding disparities throughout the state. Okay, so we're gonna take a look at a couple more policy choices that we've seen in Chicago and um, what happens from these choices. So first is a choice to open charter schools um, more frequently in areas with students of color. Uh, so what happens then is that this leads to decreased enrollment in neighborhood schools because of the perception that these charters are better academically. And so there's this decreased enrollment in the neighborhood schools that leads to decreased budgets for those schools and then ultimately frequent closures of neighborhood schools because they're being underutilized. And we know that these resulting closures disproportionately impact students of color. And for these students, school closures destabilize their neighborhood and result in academic harms in most cases. Uh, next is the decision to fund a school annex to relieve overcrowding rather than changing school boundaries to divert students to those nearby under-enrolled neighborhood schools that serve more low-income students of color. And this is something that um, we tend to see in Chicago where the spending disproportionately is going to schools that serve predominantly white middle-class students. And as a result, the under-enrolled schools serving low-income students continue to be under-enrolled and that racial and economic segregation is perpetuated. And then lastly, um, our last example is the decision to weight attainment measures of academics, like scores on standardized testing over growth measures, um, comparing a student's performance over time when developing a performance ranking rubric for the district. And this choice is made despite the fact that attainment scores are known to be a less informative measure. And despite the fact that standardized tests have been found to be racially biased. And the reason for that is that standardized tests are often designed with these racial, cultural, and socioeconomic biases built in. Essentially what happens is these test designers tend to rely on questions that assume background knowledge that's more often held by white middle-class students. And so what ends up happening is that schools with more low-income students of color end up ranking lower in their performance scores, which then leaves those schools more susceptible to closure or other intervention. So how does this all tie back to discipline? Uh, well, we already know that school discipline disproportionately impacts um, 
students of color, students with disabilities. Um, it also disproportionately, disproportionately impacts LGBTQ youth and students in the foster care system. And we also know that these disparities are not actually associated with inherent differences between groups of students. Instead, they're associated with educator bias, both implicit and explicit, as well as systemic racism in the education setting. And when left unchecked, our implicit bias makes it easier for systemic racism to take root. So thinking back to those numbers on school staffing choices, we've already seen that schools with more low-income students of color are more likely to have police assigned to their school, and they're less likely to have other types of supports. So to give you an idea of what that looks like, um, throughout the country, 1.7 million students are in schools with police but no counselors, 3 million are in schools with police but no nurses, 6 million are in schools with police but no school psychologists, and 10 million students are in schools with police officers but no social workers. And one of the main problems is that these police and school resource officers, or SROs, lack the training of social workers or school psychologists who are trained in identifying and providing appropriate supports to address these underlying issues. And in fact, research has actually shown that SROs are more likely to interpret minor behaviors like being disruptive in class or being disrespectful to a teacher as a criminal behavior. And so rather than working with students as social workers and school psychologists are trained to do, they're instead focused on the punishment and removal of these students. And what happens then is that the presence of police and security at school leads to more expulsions and suspensions, particularly for black students. Um, and actually between 2012 and 2014, black students accounted for nearly 36% of all tickets issued by SROs throughout the country and 39% of arrests made by SROs. And these higher rates of ticketing and arrests then leads to students of color being more likely to enter into the school to prison pipeline. And so I've talked um, pretty much all about uh, race throughout this presentation, but I do want to bring up this concept of intersectionality because race is not the only factor. So intersectionality is a term coined by Professor Crenshaw from the UCLA School of Law back in 1989. Uh, and she coined this term in order to describe the experiences of black women and the ways in which systems of oppression like racism and sexism interact to marginalize individuals with intersecting identities. So in order to really understand bias and these systemic inequities in school discipline, we also have to be aware of the impact of intersecting identities, including race, gender, disability, sexual orientation, and gender identity. So to give some examples of this impact, according to that national civil rights data from 2015, the 2015-16 school year, for every 100 students enrolled, Black boys lost 132 days due to school suspension and discipline. Meanwhile, Black girls had the second highest rate at 77 days, which was seven times the rate of lost instruction experienced by white girls. And so that leads us to ask why, why that is. Why is there this disparity? Well, one identified reason does go back to our discussion of systemic racism. So think about dress code policies. I think we all already know that most dress code policies tend to target clothing that's worn most often by girls. And a report done by the National Women's Law Center actually found that the racial makeup of the student body did correlate with the strictness of dress codes. And so they found that high schools that were majority black were more likely to have stricter dress codes. And these schools were more likely to prohibit students from wearing things like hair wraps, bonnets, or hats things more traditionally worn by black girls, which then led to black girls being disproportionately disciplined for dress code infractions. And um, with this disproportionate discipline also comes more severe discipline as those number of infractions racked up. Um, similarly, uh, LGBTQ youth of color often report facing harassment and bullying at school based on uh, their race, sexual orientation, gender identity, or all of these things all at once. And they also report being subjected to increased surveillance and policing, along with disproportionately harsh school discipline and blame for reporting their own victimization. 
And so one more example is the intersectionality of race and disability. So I already brought up um, earlier in this presentation that students with disabilities do also face disproportionate rates of discipline. And although they make up about 12% of student enrollment, students with disabilities account for 24% of all students expelled uh, and 28% of students who are referred to law enforcement. And in that 2015-16 school year, students with disabilities lost 68 days of instruction because of exclusionary discipline which was twice as much as the average for students without disabilities. Now consider the impact on students of color with disabilities. Uh, black students with disabilities are actually three times more likely to be suspended and four times more likely to enter the juvenile justice system than similarly situated white students. And those disparities become even worse when you also factor in gender because one in four black boys with disabilities are suspended every year compared to only one in 10 white boys with disabilities. And black boys with disabilities from low-income backgrounds are actually suspended at the highest rates of any of these subgroups. So to connect this back to the discussion of bias and systemic racism, racism, we talked about how implicit bias leads to more harsh discipline for students of color and how policy choices lead to systemic racism in the education setting. And one of the most harmful examples of this is the use of zero tolerance policies. So zero tolerance refers to school discipline policies that require school officials to give students a specific consequence, often a suspension or an expulsion, for a specific type of behavior, regardless of the circumstances or the context. And these zero tolerance policies were actually initially only intended for the most severe offenses specifically gun-related crimes in schools. But many districts took it even farther than that, and they started creating these zero-tolerance policies for nonviolent minor offenses, including the subjective infractions like disruptive or disrespectful behavior that we talked about earlier. And so when you have zero-tolerance policies for subjective infractions, it paves the way for implicit bias to also factor into that discipline decision. And what's clear from all the statistics in Illinois and nationally is that black students and students with disabilities and specifically black students with dis black students with disabilities are disproportionately impacted by zero tolerance policies and school discipline. But the research has shown us consistently that these students do not actually have higher rates of misconduct. Rather, they're disproportionately disciplined for these subjective infractions and then they're suffering more serious discipline because of these zero tolerance policies. But even as we are moving away from zero tolerance, like here in Illinois, where zero tolerance policies are actually now prohibited except in two limited circumstances, we're still dealing with that impact of implicit bias and these racial pol racist policies. And so the disparities persist and we continue to see them in the numbers reported. So now that we've talked about discipline, I wanna bring this back to the school to prison pipeline. And what's really important to note here is that with school expulsion comes this ripple effect of consequences, including the increased likelihood of school related referrals to law enforcement. And in fact, kids who are suspended or expelled are almost three times more likely to be involved in the juvenile justice system within just one year of that disciplinary action. So it's not this extended effect, it's happening really quickly. And in many cases, it's just within one year of that suspension or expulsion. And because these two things are really deeply intertwined and expungement is one half of our project, I wanna take a couple of minutes to talk um, briefly about systemic racism in the juvenile justice system. Uh, so as we saw, Similar to school discipline, youth of color is, are also more likely to be subjected to the juvenile justice system. Um, and so on this slide, I have some data on juvenile arrests and cases according to race. And similar to that discipline data, even though black youth made up only about 14% of the US juvenile population, they accounted for 35% of arrests that led to the filing of charges in juvenile court. And in Chicago, 73% of all juvenile arrests were black youth compared to only about 8% for white youth. And what we've seen is that youth of color get arrested, prosecuted, adjudicated, and detained 
in disproportionately higher numbers than white youth, even when there are similarities in offending patterns across the demographics. And black youth are also more likely to be charged with a felony than any other demographic. And it's really important to talk about because the harm of this disproportionality goes well beyond sentencing. Because the negative impacts of involvement in the juvenile justice system can cause both immediate and long-term harm. And in some cases, they can follow a juvenile offender throughout adulthood. So to give some examples, involvement in the juvenile justice system can prevent access to housing and can lead to a potential evictions. Uh, it can create barriers to enrolling in post-secondary education programs, um, obtaining financial aid for college. It can serve as barriers to employment or barriers to obtaining professional licensing and many other areas. And so the reason for this is something called permanent punishments, which refers to the laws and policies that keep people with criminal or juvenile records from getting the resources they need to build their lives. And these permanent punishments are disproportionately impacting people of color, and it's made worse by this deeply embedded systemic racism. And it's important to talk about this because even if somebody never went to court or if their case is now over, they still have a juvenile record. And the impact of that record can follow them essentially their entire lives. So when schools make the decision to refer students to law enforcement for behaviors that can and should be dealt in schools, they're really setting these kids up for lifelong consequences and are further perpetuating that school to prison pipeline. And this is a systemic issue that needs to be addressed through policy changes, like reallocating resources to hire social workers as opposed to security and handling discipline on the school level rather than referring issues to law enforcement. But in the meantime, for those students who've already been involved in the juvenile justice system, records expungement is a critical step to mitigating the effects of, school to prison, of the school to prison pipeline. It helps prevent re-entry into the juvenile justice system and can remove barriers to future success. Okay, so now that we've talked about bias and systemic racism and how it connects to the school to prison pipeline, I wanna pivot a little and bring it back to all of us as attorneys um, and the bias we may encounter in the legal profession. And so I want to highlight um, four specific biases that were identified through um, a multi-year study by the American Bar Association that found significant racial and gender bias in the legal profession. And so these are the four, um, four different biases that the Bar Association identified um, that most commonly are experienced by women and people of color. And so first is the prove it again bias. And this refers to the need for women and people of color to work harder than the majority to prove them. In that ABA study, women and people of color reported that they have to go above and beyond to get the same recognition and respect as their colleagues. And at the same time, they still get this clear message that they don't fit with people's images of a lawyer. Uh, in fact, um, in that study, women and people of color actually reported being frequently mistaken for administrative staff, court personnel, or janitorial staff. Next is the tightrope bias. Uh, so this describes that narrow range of behavior expected of or deemed appropriate for certain groups. So in the ABA study, uh, women of all races reported feeling um, pressure to behave in feminine ways and also reported experiencing backlash for masculine behaviors um, for things that while a man might be praised for being strong and assertive, a woman may be called um, aggressive, emotional, um, and in ha going hand in hand with that, they also reported being assigned higher loads of non-career enhancing administrative tasks. Um, so doing more secretarial things like note taking in meetings. Next is maternal wall bias. Uh, and this is gender bias triggered by motherhood where many women report being treated worse when they return to work after having children. And specifically they reported being passed over for promotions, being given lower quality assignments, being demoted or paid less, and being unfairly disadvantaged for working part-time or using a flexible work schedule. And then the final um, form of bias is tug of war bias. And so this actually occurs when the three other patterns of bias they identified, 
as well as other types of biases, fuel conflict within a disadvantaged group. So for example, when women receive the message that there's only room for one woman at the top, um, it makes sense then that they will end up being very competitive with other women for that one spot. And even if that's not actually the case, the perception that it is and the message that's being sent by their colleagues has the same effect of creating this intense competition. And so what are some ways that we can actually counteract our own implicit biases? Um, as I said at the very beginning, becoming aware of your own bias is the first step. And so I really encourage you all to try some of the implicit association tests um, because this is a really great way to identify and challenge your own unsupported assumptions. And then once you're aware of your own bias, you can begin exploring techniques to reduce bias, like seeking out um, counter stereotypical exemplars. And studies have actually shown this to be one of the most effective techniques for reducing bias. And what this is, is simply seeking out examples of individuals who contradict widely held stereotypes. And you can do this by sort of visually shifting that narrative using images or stories of individuals in counter stereotypical roles like female CEOs or stay-at-home dads. Uh, another technique is seeking intergroup contact. So this is looking for opportunities to engage meaningfully with people whose identities differ from yours. And then uh, last is perspective taking. Um, this is where you consider experiences from the point of view of the person being stereotyped. And you can do this by reading or watching content that discusses those experiences or by directly interacting with people from those groups. And then the final, um, final tip for counteracting bias is to slow down and take more care when processing and making decisions. Because we're more likely to rely on our implicit assumptions when we're making decisions quickly or when our cognitive capacities are overloaded, like when we are stressed, distracted, under pressure, so it's important to find ways to slow down ca and carefully examine the information and consider any possible biases or assumptions that may be at play. And one way to do this is by developing checklists or protocols to use at key decision points um, to help you slow down and give you an objective framework when processing these decisions. And there's actually quite a lot of toolkits online um, for interrupting bias in the workplace. So I really encourage you all to kind of explore that a little bit more on your own, see what tools are out there and what speaks to you. Um, and then lastly, uh, I do want to bring up how bias um, impacts our interactions with our clients and the importance of being mindful in the ways in which our, in which implicit bias, that systemic racism, and our own power and privilege can affect these relationships. So similar to this advice to slow down, um, one tip for this is practicing mindfulness, because as I said, and as we saw at the very beginning, we're more likely to apply stereotypes and rely on our implicit assumptions when we're making automatic snap decisions or when we are stressed, distracted, or under pressure. So it's important to practice ways to reduce stress increase mindfulness, and really be present when interacting with clients. Another tip is engaging empathetically with clients. It's really important that you consider your own background and assumptions, and also make sure that you're not imposing your own assumptions about your client or what's best for them on your client. Uh, and it's really helpful to, in doing these um, initial intakes, conversations with clients, advising them, that you acknowledge that you're often asking very personal questions. And so it's really important to take time to listen to your client, to build empathy and trust, to get your client to open up, with, open up to you. And then lastly is practicing active listening. Um, this is most important to help your client um, feel heard and for you to also under, make sure that you're understanding what your client has communicated. So it's really important to take time to summarize or restate what the client has said, to check for understanding and make them um, feel and understand and know that you are listening to them and you're taking in what they're saying and that you're acting based on um, 
your client's goals and their best interests. And then finally, I just wanna make one final plug for our Disrupting the School to Prison Pipeline project. Um, this school year, since kids have gone back in person, discipline has really been ramping up and cases have been coming in pretty regularly. So we are looking for volunteers to take discipline cases with us. Um, but we also understand these can be more of a time commitment. Um, so if that's a concern, we do also have our expungement work. The time commitment for those cases is only about one to two hours. And there is never a shortage of expungement cases, so we always can and are always looking for more, um, more volunteers. Um, and the really great news is that you all just completed part one of our training. So whether you're interested in our discipline work, juvenile expungement, or both, um, you can just complete the relevant sections of our online e-learning at your own pace. And then once you're done, you're all set to sign up to volunteer. So if you are interested in volunteering with us, or if you'd like more information, please contact Madeline. Her information is on this slide and at the end of the presentation. Um, I have her contact information here. Uh, and then also at the end, um, and I think we'll share out these slides, but I do have some of the sources. If any of you are interested in reading more about some of this research, implicit bias, systemic racism, um, and exploring your own biases. So I have those sources for you as well. Uh, and that's all I have. Um, did we get any questions? Does anybody have questions? Yeah, so we didn't get any specific in the question and answer, although there was a question about being able to share this presentation. It is our hope that the presentation is properly recording and we can share that. And as Hannah mentioned, we also intend to send out the slides for you all. Um, it may not be until tomorrow or potentially Friday, hopefully at the latest, just based on some staffing and technical things of that nature but we will work to get this out so everybody can see those sources that Hannah shared, as well as the other, you know, the links and the slides and things like that. And I did drop in the chat, the link to the IAT from Harvard, if you are interested in participating and kind of using some of those tests that Hannah talked about. But at this point, if anyone has any questions they wanna share, you can share them in the chat. You can raise your hand. If, you're, if it doesn't allow you to unmute yourself, then I can, I think unmute you if you raise your hand. Does anyone have any questions they'd like to share on? So to plug one more time, I did stick in the chat. First, I, my apologies that we started so late. So I do appreciate um, all of you sticking with us into this kind of slightly later time than we intended. Um, the CLE code is 1234, and the link to complete the Google evaluation so that you can get that MCLA credit, including the diversity credit, is in the chat. So if you don't see that, raise your hand, send a message. I can try to get that to you. Um, so yeah, we'll stick around for another couple of minutes in case anyone has questions. But otherwise, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time and your learning with us. <laughs>
And it looks like most people have jumped off. So I wanted to say on just in case any folks had questions about using the CLE form or anything, but I think at this point we should be good to go. All right, you're muted, but bye. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye.